Okay, we're going to get started. Thank you, everyone, for showing up. I apologize for a little bit of delay. We'll do what we normally do and start with the prayer and then the pledge. Pastor Neil, if you wouldn't mind. Father heaven, we thank you, Lord, for this day that you've given to us. We thank you, Lord, for the freedom we have to assemble like this. We thank you for what our, our leaders and legislators here meet with us today. Lord, I pray that you bless this time. Above all, we thank you for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will die for our sins, lives today. Lord, I pray you bless this time together, be productive. Lord, I pray you give wisdom. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you very much. Would you lead us, please? <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You know, I saw a little spiel on what's been going on in Boise, and then when they're done, and they tend to be in the will take questions when they're done. It's an update, not a spiel. A spiel has a negative connotation. I've been trying to sell something here. <laughs> Just a minor update of what's been happening in the past month. Uh, the senator went first in Sandpoint, so I'm going to go first here. Representative Sage Dixon, Senator Jim Woodward. Uh, we work well together, despite some differences. He talks more than I do. I <laughs> timed this in Sandpoint. OK, I should be quiet then. No, no, but, um, thank you. It's, it's always a great opportunity for us to come back and to share with you what we've been seeing, and especially the second time to tell you how things have been progressing and what new things have popped up since the last time we spoke. Um, being on the Rev and Tax Committee, Revenue and Taxation Committee, lots of discussion on things going through there, property taxes, which a senator will talk about because that bill is coming out of the Senate, not a whole lot coming out of the House in regards to that. But what we did talk about was making use of a lot of the surplus that we have and the, the forecast additional revenue that should be coming in and one proposition that came out was House Bill 199. Now, the downside is it's not going anywhere. It ran into some resistance after it was printed, but what that did was it was going to lower our income tax levels by about half a percent, lower the corporate tax by half a percent, and lower the grocery or the sales tax down to 5.3% from six. And that sounded like a very positive uh, bill to me because it would touch every of our major parts of taxation with the exception of property taxes. And it would be removing that grocery sales tax, I mean, the grocery tax credit that you have on your tax form that you take to do that. But when they looked through the numbers and how that was going to affect different families, single people did very well, married couples with no children did well. But as you got into married couples with children, the benefit of having that grocery tax uh, credit on your taxes really helped families with three children, four children, and more going forward when they were filing joint. So, that plan met some resistance, and they changed it. But we're, as far as removing that sales tax component of it, so the sales tax with this new proposal that should be coming out next week will be remaining at 6%, but they're still going to be lowering our, our top tier and all the ones underneath by about half a percent. So where we're at 6.9 for our top tier at income, it'll go down to 6.4. And that is, our top tier only takes $12,000 to get there, so that's still a lot of people to do that. It's an odd system. We're trying to consolidate those tiers, but it's difficult because the people on the bottom tend to get no reduction, and then you have the cry of you're only helping the rich if you're removing the top level down, but we're all almost rich if it's only $12,000 at that point going up there. But still, all through those brackets, it'll be lowered, and then corporate tax will be coming down to 6.5 also. Last time we lowered corporate tax, that's when our economy really started booming about four years ago. And, and so we're going to be doing that again because we're growing by leaps and bounds. And we have been very, very benefited, as bad as COVID was for some of the, the mandates that came out and things like that. But Idaho was far more open than our surrounding states, and people were pouring into Idaho. So our coffers are relatively full. Plus, it didn't help or hurt, I should say, the federal dollars that were coming in that people were spending. So we have derived a lot of sales tax revenue from that going forward. Um, we also have... Uh, so some of the things going on with the emergency orders and a lot of the large topics that we talked about last time and what we went down there to do, we did set out of the House, House Bill 135, and that's been the largest thing thus far. Well, I'll back up. House Joint Resolution 3, I believe it was, was a constitutional amendment, a proposed constitutional amendment that the legislature could call itself back into session. Currently, if you remember, only the governor can call us back into session, and that was a large problem when COVID hit and all the orders that were coming out, we could do nothing as a legislature all throughout last year because that all started right after we left. 
So it was very important for many of us in the legislature to make sure that we could call ourselves back into session. What we sent over to the Senate, some problems with it on their side as far as it looked like it was too wide open. There was concerns that we would become a full-time legislature. It did still take 60% of our body to call ourselves back, but there weren't sideboards on it. The Senate has put some sideboards on it, as, as we term it, to still have the 60%, but it needs to be a defined subject, similar to how the governor would call us back for a specific topic. There would have to be a specific topic or topics that we were coming back to meet on, so it wouldn't be wide open which is just fine with most of us in the House, what the Senate is doing, passed off the floor. Am I correct, or did I hear you wrong again? Senate, the Senate Joint Resolution yes, passed off. passed off. So it should be coming over to State Affairs in the House this next week. And from what I've heard in our chairman's meetings and just among the body, nobody really has a problem with it. So that should come through. So then it'll be coming out to the public in 2022 on your ballot to either approve that or, or deny the ability for the legislature to call itself back into session to address those specific topics. Um, House Bill 135 factors into that a little bit also. This is one that was worked on since before we got there. And when, again, when I said this last time, we got there and everybody's sharing their different ideas. We're having to work through the different parts of code that we were attacking, not attacking, but, but going to, to try and find out what the best way to move forward is so that we weren't sending a bill that the Senate would find was wrong or, or they could be defeated by, uh, by lawsuit. But 135, has to do with, with businesses, that businesses are deemed essential in there. It protects your First Amendment rights of freedom of assembly and freedom of religion, so you'd still be able to go to church. It limits the governor to 60 days for an emergency declaration without the legislature approving further emergency. So it gives him 30, he can redo it for another 30, but then he has to come to the legislature and ask for that to be re-upped. So we have a protection there as well. And there was uh, one other thing I can look up if there's a bigger question involved in that. So those were good bills. I mean, that's good. It's on its way to the Senate. I'm not sure what's going to happen there, but it'll go through Senate State Affairs hopefully pretty soon. Uh, we also passed a business bill of rights, which just further augments how a business can stay in business if there is another emergency order that that won't affect them. It, it gives a little more teeth to that section of it. Uh, we have a bill that should be coming through House Agriculture about hemp. For the past two or three years, we've have been having discussions on how to allow hemp cultivation within the state. There's been a lot of concern from prosecuting attorneys, from law enforcement, that they can't differentiate between hemp and marijuana. The plant looks very similar. They have different chemical contents that aren't hemp, obviously, is not, um, doesn't have the THC, which is the, the drug part of it, or the stimulant, the psychoactive part of that. But this one, just deals with cultivating it for the farmers, just being able to grow it. It's very, very narrowly tailored, and those folks that opposed it previously are now in support of this one. So we should see that coming forward. It's a, a, something the ag community is very interested in doing. They like hemp for crop rotation because it puts more nutrients back in the ground. And there's also a market for it that's growing internationally and nationally. So there's purpose in that. They want to be able to grow hemp so they can uh, go into that market. So that's something nice. A lot of it was held up previously because of two House members were battling each other over what this was going to look like. One was working with Farm Bureau, another was working with another group. And so it, all, it blew up about the past two years. But this one, everybody's on board moving forward. Does it have a number? Uh, no, not yet. I believe it's just a print hearing next year. But I, I'll check, Linda. I didn't bring the paperwork I had on that. I apologize. Something we heard in transportation had to do with the fees at the DMV because we have the locals, the sheriff is responsible for facilitating driver's licenses. And in the larger counties, they're losing a lot of money. So we, they charge a fee for the driver's license and $5 goes to the sheriff's department for each driver's license. But they have to hire and staff, I mean, and run those buildings. So there's been an ongoing problem there also with them asking us to raise those fees. We heard that bill in transportation. We printed it, but we'll have the full hearing next week probably. But the more we talked about that, it seems like that's probably not what we need to do, even though counties are bearing a little bit of that burden and subsidizing for that. But more and more, your registration for, uh, renewals and your licenses are being done online. So there's less need for that personal interaction going forward. And we think there might be a different way to do it. We're also going to be allowing the dealerships to do your registration so you don't have to go to the DMV to do registration. It'll be kind of a one-stop shop and possibly allowing 
third parties to issue our driver's licenses as well. So that will remove even more of the burden as we head in that direction on the locals. So I probably don't think we're going to go in raising those fees. Raising fees is never popular, even though it's something we forced on the, the counties. So we think about that a little bit more closely, but nobody really wants to raise fees. And if we have these other methods for people to get what they need in a different spot, there probably won't be a reason to, to do that. And I'm going to try and be shorter than I normally am, so we have more time for questions. Um, I've had a couple bills that I sponsored get off the House floor and they're headed to the Senate. The first one was what we call the Reindeer Freedom Bill. And I say we because a good senator is going to carry it. Uh, I had a couple constituents, or we did, contact me in the late fall with interest in having a reindeer ranch up here in North Idaho. And there's been a prohibition since 1994 on any reindeer north of the Salmon River. And a lot of that had to do with the caribou herd that was coming down from Canada and above Priest Lake over there. And so fishing game wasn't too excited because sometimes if you have domestic animals that are mixing with wild animals, that messes up what they're doing as fishing game. So that's why that prohibition was there. That herd is no longer there. Canada has moved their herd 200 miles away. There's very, very little chance of any interaction in doing this. And I spoke to the state vet and the Department of Ag who will permit those processes and the fish and game, and they were all fine. So that flew through the house, and it's just kind of a fun, funny thing that we get to do for our constituents and calling it reindeer freedom, and now Santa could come up to North Idaho. Um, so that, that went through really easy, and we should be hearing it in the Senate relatively soon. We're trying to get our constituents to be able to come to that, so we're holding off. Um, I ran a bill regarding parental rights and strengthening parental rights in an emergency or a disaster declaration. When we went into the emergency declaration, uh, that gives the executive branch of the governor the opportunity to suspend rules that the executive branch deals with. And when he suspended some of those rules, some people found that it was possible for Child Protective Services to go into a home. There's a prohibition where they couldn't do it, but when those rules were suspended, they would be able to come into a home and remove a child. So there's many people I heard from, from our district and other legislators did across the state, that they were fearful of that. So what the bill says is that an emergency order or declaration does not constitute a compelling government interest. And that's the term we use for the gov government to be able to go in and take a child to abridge those parental rights. But just because we have an emergency declaration, that doesn't mean the government can just go in and take a child if, if those things get suspended. Because conceivably, mom and dad get COVID, then in order to protect the children, we're going to go in and take them out of there. And I think a lot of people realized there was kind of a, of a danger there. So that went through very easily, both out of committee and off the floor. And I believe I have a hearing ne late next week. Um, can you wait until we're done with our spiel, as, as Robin said, and then we'll be happy to take questions in doing that. Another one that I had some uh, constituents contact me about is called Safe Families for Children. And it's a kind of a parallel program or a diversion for foster care. So if a family's in crisis, either homelessness or spousal abuse or whatever, and it looks like they might be heading towards the foster care system, this allows private organizations to be what are called temporary caregiver programs. And they would be able to have a roster of families that are willing to take children for an extended period of time on short notice. It's completely parental driven. So as we had meetings with health and welfare, they said we have no jurisdiction here, which made us really happy because normally they would try and license this process. We've had issues with folks up here that ran group homes that were just voluntary, but they said you had to have a license. So this allows these families or these groups to start. It's basically codifying it just so health and welfare can't change their mind. Because if you get a new director of health and welfare or something changes, if we build this infrastructure, they could just say no. So this is putting it in statute that we're allowing this type of program, completely parental driven. It's usually run by churches or crisis pregnancy centers, but anybody can do it. And in there, it gives it some shape so that not anybody can just throw up a shingle and say, we'll take your children. You have to participate in some sort of background check program and things to ensure the safety. There'll be annual inspections of the home and things like that. And that went really well through both the committee and was unanimous off the floor as well. And that should be going over to the Senate. Um, okay, what else did we talk about out down there? There's probably more that'll come up in questions. I'll just leave it at that. Thank you, we'll go to Senator Woodward. Well, good afternoon, thanks for showing up. Uh, happy to have everyone here. Uh, I serve on the finance committee and that's a, a big part of my day every day so that's uh, anytime I start out I start talking about the, the finances and we are in the budget setting portion of the, the legislative session now we start out that the first six weeks and we hear from all of the agencies when they come through and, and talk to us and explain 
their budget and what they'd like to do, anything that they'd like to have added to or taken away from their budget. We go through that for the first six weeks. We're past that period now. And, and so now we are, as a committee, are working through all of those budgets and we write about 120 different appropriation bills that uh, we'll send out of that joint committee, the joint being, we have 10 House members and 10 Senate members, and we write an appropriation bill and then send it off to the House and Senate, uh, which is a little different as a joint committee versus where the normal process to put something into law is that it starts out in the House committee and then House floor and then back to Senate committee, Senate floor or vice versa, but it goes through two different committees prior to the floor on each end of the building. And so this, the Joint Finance and Appropriations Committee, we write those bills as one committee and then send those off uh, to, the, to the Senate and the, or to the House and the Senate. So what we, uh, during that the earlier portion and, and still just kind of finishing up on now are some of the, what are called supplemental appropriations or for the fiscal year that we're in now. The fiscal year runs from Ju uh, July 1st through June every year. And so right now we're in fiscal year 21, which started back in the middle of 2020. And at this point, as we're getting toward the end of the year, we know more about this, the status of revenue. As, we're get, as we get closer to the end, we can see how much money has come in, uh, how much money has not been spent in places. And so we're making some of those supplemental appropriations for, lap, for the fiscal year now that we're in now uh, to make adjustments to that budget. And of course, we, we always have that requirement here in the state to have a balanced budget. And so that's obviously taken into consideration. Uh, one of the big supplemental appropriations that, uh, that we got, ran through JFAC the other day that I uh, and the bill sponsor for is a, a fiscal year 21 supplemental appropriation for transportation projects. Um, some of you may have heard we, we have more money than they anticipated this year because of higher economic activity and also because we uh, a couple other things including a higher match rate on the, the Medicaid system. So we have more federal money flowing in. So that has left us options on, on some uh, other spending. And so um, the proposal put forth by the governor's office, we're, we're working with, with that as a guideline. And, and so that transportation supplemental that we ran through the other day was of $122 million of additional money for fiscal year 21. Uh, that'll get broken up $70 million into uh, Idaho Transportation Department projects. And then the other, most of the balance of that, some 40 some, uh, 47 million into local units of government. And so that's going out to the counties and cities and highway districts around the state. And that, that 47 million will get distributed out based on the, the highway distribution formula out of the highway distribution account. So the, the counties, uh, I didn't, I forgot to look up the number, I apologize here, but uh, most of the counties are anywhere from 300,000 to a million dollars that'll be coming out of that, and, which to, and it can use that for road projects. Um, and then the cities get a, a little bit smaller amount, typically unless they're a bigger city, because it, that distri highway distribution is based on the number of people and the number of miles of road and a few other things. But so my uh, the overarching idea here, though, that there, there was some money left over, or there's more money than we normally have. And so we're putting that a good portion of that into roads and will be that'll be coming out soon for the both for the transportation department to work with the, high, the state transportation department as well as the road and bridge department here in the county will will get some of that money. Um, so that is that fiscal year 21 uh, adding on. And then I said we're now into the budget setting portion of the process for fiscal year 2022, which will start this for July 1st of 2021. So coming up here in the middle of the summer, we'll start the next fiscal year. And we're working on uh, establishing that balanced budget. And, and so uh, this past week, we set the budget for higher ed in, in the state of Idaho, which is the four four-year universities that we have uh, down in Pocatello, Idaho State University, Boise State University, Lewis and Clark, and then up to Moscow with the University of Idaho. So we set those budgets, uh, set the budgets for all the, the four community colleges in the state, and then some of the other programs in, in higher education here in the state. Uh, 
you may have caught some of the debate around the higher education budget, which has been a little bit uh, controversial that may, the, some of the content being provided at some of the four-year universities is, uh, may not be where, uh, in, in, align, in alignment with the Idaho values. Uh, that's an open question there. But there has there definitely been a lot of interest in it. And it uh, you having a hard time hearing me? I'm sorry. Uh, so it, the, the question has been in that higher ed budget, and so I'm touching on this because there was quite a bit of controversy surrounding that higher education budget for the four or four-year universities that, uh, that, that some, there was some classes and some course content being taught that was uh, in, along the lines of the, the social justice message. And so there's been a lot of talk and and we're trying to, and, and so in fact, what happened this year was that the higher education budget was reduced by $400,000 uh, to send a message that we want to make sure that that course content is in alignment with what, what we're interested in having taught at our four-year universities. That, that conversation went everywhere from an $18 million reduction to adding more money and, and the, the answer that we send out of the, the Joint Com Finance and Appropriations Committee, our recommendation is a $400,000 reduction, along with a reporting requirement to come back to us of, of what classes are being taught in that, uh, in that arena. That still has to go through the House and the Senate, and we'll see how that does. But uh, anyhow, that, that was the, the big conversation last week on higher education. The transportation budget, in addition to that supplemental appropriation from fiscal year 21, we set the new budget for fiscal year 22. Um, that's just a fairly standard budget going along with what's uh, what's available to work with. And a lot uh, where some of the budgets in the state are are uh, paid for uh, in a large amount through general fund dollars, and general fund dollars being your state income tax and state sales tax. Other budgets are heavily weighted with uh, federal money. Uh, so the Transportation Department is one of those and the Health and Welfare Department and uh, um, the education budget is actually a, has a pretty only about a 10% of it is federal money whereas our transportation budget a lot of that money is, is our federal dollars it's still our taxpayer dollars but it's been collected through federal taxes and, and brought back to, to us. So each of these budgets is different as to what portion is Idaho taxpayer dollars, your federal taxpayer dollars, or some other budgets are comprised uh, heavily of dedicated funds, like fish and game when you buy a hunting tag, their budget is almost entirely coming from those dedicated funds that can only be spent in that, uh, that budget. The next week coming up, we'll set the K-12 budget, so the, the our high schools down to kindergarten budget. Uh, we have some others coming up, the Department of Environmental Quality, Idaho State Patrol, some other budgets like that coming up. A couple little pieces you might find interesting now, uh, going moving away from the budget process. Uh, we have some bills coming up. Uh, if you have an ATV and, uh, and you've ever had a challenge, especially this last year, getting the sticker for it, in the past, just like a vehicle, like a car license plate, the sticker you get is associated with a specific vehicle identification number and we'll probably will do away with that for ATVs and motorcycles and that. So you'll just be able to buy a sticker and put it on and, and be legal with that. That'll simplify and, and make it easier so that more places, more uh, you can get those stickers in more places. So um, along with that, a separate bill about uh, about uh, travel of ATVs on the highways. Right now in Idaho, a side-by-side, -side, for example, can drive on local roads, uh, a four-wheeler or side-by-side with the off-road sticker, can drive on local roads, or excuse me, the off-road plate, uh, and then cross a highway, just for a, a, to cross and get to the other side of the highway. But this bill that I, we see coming up right now is proposes uh, to allow ATVs to be able to run on the highway for up to five miles if you're trying to make a, a transfer. If you come off of one area and you, and you need to run up the highway a little bit to transfer over and get to the other side of the highway. Uh, a speed limit, of, uh, there's some details in it. Uh, only on roads with speed limits below 60 miles per hour 
and then a speed limit of 35, which may cause a little bit of a conflict for the actual vehicle. Uh, but we'll see how that comes through. It's, that is, those have both cleared the House and they're headed over to the Senate. So we'll hear those in Senate transportation here soon. And then another one, snowmobile stickers. Uh, raising the rates just a little bit on snowmobile stickers that the clubs that and the Idaho State Snowmobile Association and then the groomer clubs both here in Boundary County and Bonner County and all through the state have asked to raise those fees and this is an example of a dedicated fund where the, the when you buy your snowmobile sticker then that money only goes to the groomer program and the, the folks who are running the snowmobiles are asking to raise that rate a little bit to be able to have the groomer out on the trail more often, buying diesel fuel and paying the operator out there. So sometimes raising fees is it becomes a sensitive issue in the legislature. Uh, just anytime you talk about raising government uh, fees, then, then you get some feedback on that. But uh, I think that uh, this one where the, the people who are uh, uh, receiving the benefit of those fees are asking for that fee increase, uh, hopefully that will be uh, something we can do for those folks. Uh, other bills I've seen lately, an air travel enhancement program, uh, air service, intrastate air service in Idaho doesn't really exist right now where we used to have air service, say between Lewiston and Boise, Lewiston Airport is fairly large, or it's fairly large for an Idaho airport, uh, and then Idaho Falls over to Boise, Coeur d'Alene to Boise, and none of those exist right now. Uh, the proposal came out after some study last year to to have uh, to enhance somehow put these air tra air routes back in place uh, the proposal is a, a minimum revenue agreement which means taking your general fund dollars that we, income tax and sales tax and using some of that that tax then to to guarantee a revenue for any air tra air carrier that might want to run routes um, I voted against it and, and because I, I, I think we just need to leave that to the free market. If the, the market will, will support that, then someone will fill that need. Um, so it did make it out of the Senate by one vote. So we'll be relying on the House in this case to be the, <laughs> the, the uh, bearer of the free market principles. Uh, another one that came up last week that, that drew quite a bit of attention uh, is the idea of a driver authorization card. Uh, this is in response uh, in the, the agricultural industry and especially in the southern end of the state relies a lot on labor that's not documented. Uh, so uh, the short story is it, it was killed for the year just in case to remove any anticipation here but the the proposal that was first talked about last year and then put forward as a bill this year and we heard it in committee and, and and did not move that forward and so it's done for the year but this idea that uh we have a lot of folks here the nice way of saying not documented that they're, they're not in legal status they're here in the united states not in a legal status but they're supporting a, a big industry down there and, and that wouldn't exist in, in Idaho. Uh, but really, it, it's, uh, it's a federal problem because the federal government uh, is in charge of immigration inside and outside of the United States. And, and so we need to figure out how to deal with that at the federal level, not, uh, I, I think, at the state level to, to put a driver authorization card in place and to look over here and provide a document that says you're legal to drive uh, while over here saying you're not legal to be in the United States, there's a problem there. We need to deal with it. Uh, but so it, it's, it's very difficult and, and it's less, probably less difficult for me because I live up here and represent folks uh, where we don't have that challenge as much, but the industry in the South um, it is a, a part of how we have our milk and, and how we have our potatoes. Uh, so I, while sitting through that hearing, I, I, I uh, wondering why we can't deal with this at the federal level, and the thought came to mind that I, I think that the Dust Bowl of the uh, early in the last century 
wasn't real until the dust got to Washington, D.C. And so maybe uh, when, when we quit shipping milk and potatoes to Washington, D.C., maybe that's when we'll deal with uh, this at the federal level. So, uh, anyhow, that, uh, that one is not going anywhere for the year. That last piece I'll touch on, the uh, property taxes and uh, an attempt to figure out how to, con to, to limit property taxes. I, we have really, have, as residents of Idaho, we pay three major taxes, income tax, sales tax, and property tax. And we have control over two of those, much more direct individual control over two of those, because the amount you make, how, how much you want to work and make, uh, can, to somewhat determines what you're paying income tax, because we, and here in the state, we pay at 6.925%, and the more you make, well, you still pay that same percentage, but you have some input on that. And the same goes for sales tax. If you, the more you spend, then the more you pay in that tax, but you, your lifestyle, you get to make life choices about how much that tax is, whereas property tax, uh, we don't we often feel like we are less, much less in control of that uh, as uh, residential values go up significantly then we see uh, our assessed values go up and then although your assessed value and the budget are not tied directly it, it does uh, affect that because it, the higher your prop the more your property is worth especially in comparison to other types of property if houses are going up fast in value and, and the uh, timber and commercial and ag are not moving as fast then you start to pick up more and more load on the residential side of, of the property tax equation. So there's an effort to try and get this straightened out and, and we deal with this uh, every time that, that we have the economy is running strong like it is now. We, in 2006 there was a substantial change made to property tax here in the state of Idaho when we went from 5% sales tax to 6% sales tax but pulled the maintenance, the school maintenance and operation levies off of the uh, off of the table there. So right now we're again having the same conversation that we've had probably every decade or decade and a half in Idaho's history with property tax. And that Senate Bill uh, 1108 right now is, is the proposal that's out there. It's, uh, it's on the Senate calendar. I expect we'll vote on it this week. Uh, it sets a, a budget cap on taxing districts so that which we have right now but it changes the rules around those and it also changes the rules around two other parts of the the budget growth uh, formula when so yeah yeah uh, right now in idaho code budgets a, a taxing district whether that's a fire district or a library district or a county or a city can increase their budget by three percent every year and so that $100,000 budget can go to 103000 But in addition to that, there were allowances made not too long ago for uh, new construction. The, the areas that are seeing a lot of new houses come in, they're trying to pick up the, the effect of those because as you put new houses at, and new neighborhoods in, you want to be able to pay for that off of the, the folks who just moved in there. And so. Um, there, it's, there's a new construction calculation that allows the budget to increase by more than 3%. And then there's also one more provision in our property tax code that says that if the taxing district didn't take the full 3% in previous years, say that they went, a, a taxing district took 0% and then the next year it again did 0%, well now they have banked 6% increase. So then you could go into the third year and have a 3% increase and grab the 3% and the other 3% and have a bigger increase. And that's caused problems in, in different situations. Uh, and so uh, there's that bill limits uh, or changes that, that new construction calculation and, and the foregone is, is a little bit different, but it puts a total budget cap in place for all the, the factors. Um, what I see representing our districts that looking at the numbers of what has gone on at the taxing districts and the, uh, but we really this the, the bill that's on the table wouldn't change much for us at all 
uh, but the, the, the areas that are really seeing significant growth, Ada Canyon County, Canyon County, the two that sit side by side right there by Boise, Meridian, Caldwell, and then Kootenai County is also a, a seeing a lot of this, uh, that these bills would impact those districts. And so I, I'm not quite sure yet if I'm on board with Senate Bill 1108 because uh, what I'm in my mind right now, it is a statewide solution to a three county problem. And we, when we write code, it applies to the whole state. And, and sometimes uh, uh, if you put something out that will affect those other counties differently, uh, you, you just can be unintended consequences. And so trying to make sure we're in the right spot, uh, still deliberating on that one. So I think I'm good. Okay. I'm abrupt finish like me. <clears throat> Did you want us to do questions or are you going to facilitate that? Okay. Okay. Saves us. The mic's not on. We'll just have to speak louder for you. Oh, that is that you, Sherry? I didn't see that was you. Okay. <laughs> I just heard a voice. No, I know that, but I didn't. I didn't know. The little thing they did. The microphone is right up there, but Oh, this. Okay. She's a voice from above. Yes. We're gonna have to talk into that, Jim. Or... Oh, the little one there. Oh, oh Robin. So Robin can be heard. I'm just gonna point. <laughs> oh, okay. well, so, over here. Hi, I'm Rob and Steve. I want to piggyback on um, this district. This is what I'm seeing. Um, we're seeing the price of lumber going up for building. The gas is, since the last time you guys come, that has jumped up. And then um, we have a massive move coming up into this county, and people are paying. Twenty to a hundred thousand dollars more than the asking price, and this is not uncommon. So when you're talking about taxes, my property values are going artificially shooting up, and we're going to be paying more taxes next year. And I'm not hearing anything about this from you guys, and we have some concerns up here. If I go first, and so. That aside, I, I have two specific questions for both of you that a lot of this county has concerns with, and that's the mandates with the masks and then the vaccinations. Are you in support of the vaccinations? So those are my questions. Okay. Well, I'll just start with not in support of vaccinations at all. And that bill that I wrote about parental rights, it says, shall not abridge parental rights and forced removal from a home or forced medical action to protect against vaccinations in schools and things like that as well, if that was to happen. So I protected that within that. But the language I wrote, it was in an effort to protect against forced vaccinations on children, saying that there was a compelling government interest to do that. Um, it's been difficult to get any type of strong protection because of the chairman of health and welfare in the House. And I think it's a similar situation in the Senate. There's been multiple proposals that have come to him that would provide protections against mandated vaccinations, and he won't hear them. One that did get through the House has to do, it came through Commerce. So very smart of this lady from District 7 to go this route where you cannot require a business or a business doing business with the state because Commerce in the House does, is, deals with local government business and, and the business of the state. So if you're a business that is doing business with the state or contracting, you cannot require a vaccination for your employees in order to keep doing business with the state. So that's about the only thing that we've been able to do at this point. We've tried many different things. We're looking at it as far as not discriminating on your personal medical choices. Or um, There's another one, but it's more about masks. And then <clears throat> we're creeping into telling business what to do, and that's always very difficult for us conservatives to do that. But at the same time, we're balancing personal rights and realizing that national and international corporations may be requiring those things to use their services. So that's a tough balancing act for many of us in the House that are looking to provide those protections for the individual, but at the same time not wanting to start to dictate to businesses what they should do. But we're looking at those things. And the mask mandate, Panhandle Health is the only health district that has a requirement now in the state. And it's very disappointing that North Idaho is behind even Central Idaho or the Central Health District that does Ada County. Uh, that, that's wrong. And we were talking about that before we came in here. We don't know why they have not 
gone back and revisited this when every other health district in the state has already rescinded that mandate. So I've been against that. I don't wear it. I will admit, they ask you at the restaurants down there just to put it on. It's ridiculous because to walk from here to there, I have to put a mask on and in about two steps, I'm taking it off again and you're sitting at a table and there's people around you and it's just a dumb thing that the restaurant's asking. And my, for me, it's not worth fighting there. It's just this and then off. But we don't wear them in the Capitol unless you want to. It's a totally personal choice. We don't require it. And um, so I'm not in favor of that at all. I'm sorry to, to jump in front of you because you were going to start with the property tax issue. No, that's all right. Um, <clears throat> I'll just, since I'm going. Go. Um, I have not been excited about the property tax proposals that have come out. There was a, a working group that met in the interim, and they came up with some ideas that are biting around the edges. It's not really directly going at the problem. One thing that came out of the House is a Uniformity and Transparency Act because our locals throughout the, the state don't use the same accounting practices. They don't report it the same. So nobody really can look and see what's going on from one place to another or even you as a citizen to go and look and see what boundaries doing. It's difficult. So this law will make every local jurisdiction, be it county and city in the state, have the same accounting practices and the same reporting practices and it will be uploaded onto Transparent Idaho which the state controller's website has. Because right now you can see everything the state does and how much everybody makes and all that. All this local data will be loaded onto there too. So that'll be a bonus going forward or a plus, meaning you can look more closely at what the counties are doing because most of that property tax issue has to do with how budgets are set in all the taxing districts and what your county does as well in doing that. The second one is what the Senator's talking about that's coming through over there. Um, I've had multiple conversations with our revenue and taxation chairman about trying to find a better way to do this. And what always comes up is Prop 13 in California because a lot of folks are moving up from California and that seemed like a just way to do the taxes to hold it at a level when you purchase the home. So as you age and if you're there all the time, you know what to expect. You're not going to be forced out of your home when you're on a fixed income because of property taxes. I, we have a prohibition in our constitution about equal and taxation where you can't really do that. So that would be the first step to fix is a constitutional amendment. I think we should have done that this year. And I was wrapped up in a lot of other things. So I didn't start that because a lot of people in the state are angry about property taxes for the exact reason that you're saying in doing that. That's a conversation that I'm promoting in the house and we're getting somewhere with that as far as it seems like a reasonable answer. It's not moving the burden from here to there. That's always a concern is if we're squeezing a balloon or playing whack-a-mole, uh, meaning, okay, we addressed this here, but now these folks are having to pay more and they're mad at us, so they come back and then we have to try and address this. And the way our, our tax situation is now for property taxes, that's what we've been doing. So uh, something that is predictable and stable and just for everybody, I think is some way to hold that down, whether you hold your assessed value when you bought it or whether you hold your tax where you bought it and then when it sells or a new home is built, that goes up to whatever the market value is there. We're looking at that more deeply. At least myself and the chairman of revenue and taxation, he's an engineer and loves numbers and builds graphs and so he gets all that hard data. I just have really good ideas, I think, in doing that. So um, we're looking at it and things may come up because there is time. We're getting close to our normal end of session, but if, if there's an idea that everybody's on board with, it can move. But it's just, if you have to try and convince a lot of people at this point in the session, it's hard. So that may be coming up next year. I certainly, I feel like I'm make, not just me, but making progress with that notion like that so that to protect people in their homes so they don't get taxed out of them. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Steve. Um, Jim. Jim. Sorry, Jim. <laughs> so I, I'm going through the same thought process on the taxation because we do have that constitutional piece and so we have to ch make that change but uh, I, I guess in my mind, I'm, I'm thinking about property tax and what the origins are, and it goes back hundreds and hundreds of years. And it, uh, so I, I think property tax was originally based on the notion that what you owned was an indicator of your ability to contribute, You're going back to England maybe, and I, then maybe that notion has gone by the wayside. That's where I was talking a few minutes ago about so we have sales tax and income tax and, and then property tax, uh, those three big pieces. And so I, it, it's definitely time to figure out uh, what, what we, uh, we can do with it. And, and maybe that is the right answer to go after uh, um, the, the, the notion or the idea that when you, you buy in at a certain level and then you continue to have that predictable uh, change, not 
not these large scale changes that we're seeing right now. Because basically, we're we're taking the, the a different economy, economy of a different scale, and blending it with Idaho's economy right now. I, this is probably about like what happened in 1989 when the uh, the wall went down between a, a Cold War devastated economy and West modern Western Germany economy. We we'll have to blend those two, and we're we're doing the same thing. Where that the money off the coast is just at a higher level, and so that that's that pain we're feeling right now. And so we we need to figure out an answer for sure. And then your your direct questions were. Uh, uh, mandated vaccines, no, I just don't think you'll see that come out of the Idaho legislature. And, and, and no, I wouldn't support mandatory vaccines. And then the second question was... Mask mandates. Oh, yeah, I, well, he answered it. I, we're both surprised that Panhandle Health District hasn't been back into a meeting to figure that out. Is that I'll say there isn't anything in place statewide. There isn't anything in the other health districts. Um, and the numbers are looking good, so... I am on, the governor has a vaccine advisory committee and I said, why are there no legislators on there? And they said to me, thank you for volunteering. So um, I, I'm, I participate in those meetings. That discussion has never approached that because that was my greatest concern. If it was gonna filter in from the federal government somehow into the state of Idaho through this advisory committee. But it, it's been very uh, mundane discussions about does the guy that drives the van that takes a, a high risk patient to the hospital need to have, be able to get the vaccine. And it's all been about who, the priority setting of who should get that vaccine. It's been no discussion whatsoever about mandates. You can't mandate most of these, new, the first three vaccines that came out anyway, because they were emergency authorizations federally. So you can't instill any mandate, even the feds on that. Now this Johnson & Johnson one, I don't know if it's had time to go through the whole process, but um, I'm not hearing anything federally from that either, but th you won't see that here in Idaho. You're up, Rob. <laughs> I've heard it said that um, the reason that the uh, private income taxes, land taxes, and uh, private property taxes are going up is uh, there's several points. One is that so much of our local forest lands and just lands, uh, 80, like something like 80 percent belongs to the Fed and to the state here. And so that puts the burden on the uh, residents' uh, private property to come up with the funds that are needed to carry on with the um, city needs and county needs. And then um, we used to get what were called PILT, payment in lieu of taxes, because when they shut down the woods for um, logging and human activities, that made it so that we didn't get um, revenue from those things and they were they promised these PILT payments to uh, make up for that and now the PILT funds are dwindling but the burden is still on the people to come up with uh, the funds that are needed to run a county. Uh, so I think we really need to be aware of this as one of the root problems. So if you, last time around, I spoke quite a bit about that. So I see a lot of faces that I don't want to go back into good neighbor authority and all that. But everything you said, I think is you're right on track. Um, so we just passed out of the House a resolution to put some dollars into a pilot study to a program that was developed in Utah that is going to put a market value on all those federal lands within counties. So counties can go in, to the federal government. It's a little bit of a lever saying this is what we're losing by you owning these lands within our county. And there's going to be two counties. It's probably going to be Idaho County or Valley County down south and somewhere else. I tried. My name's on the, the bill because it's something that I've worked with with the gentleman in Utah that, that put it through there. Um, trying to get more of those dollars back to get more management over our lands, which was moving along very well under Trump. But it's all gone now <laughs> at this point. So that, that's a positive. At least the counties will be able to look and say these are the dollars that we should have if this was taxes, it should be taxed instead of the payment in lieu of taxes in doing that. A lot of the county, it's an unequal distribution right now, so some counties don't like that because they're getting more than other counties are, and if it becomes equal, then they might lose. So there's a little pushback from some counties in doing that, but it's just a pilot program at least to go in that direction to, to show that, to yeah, the right, somewhere. right, to take a look at it, to, to, make, to show we're not getting the dollars we should because those were $1970, I think, at this point. I always say to people, I, I grew, this was my paper route across the street. I grew up right here. 
And we didn't talk about how to fund schools or how to take care of road and bridge because timber sales took care of that. 25% of the proceeds from the timber sales in the county were going to road and bridge and to the schools and there just wasn't a question. And I'm but concerned that mechanism went away. with the Good Neighbor Authority with the new administration coming in at a different focus on how to manage lands and, and what the environment needs and things like that because we were starting to harvest more to clean up to help mitigate wildfires as well but also to get timber into the mills so it's cheaper what you were talking about and all those things that our economy needs up here so there's a concern there as well. The, the numbers I know we, we brought uh, had 1.25 billion out of the first round of CARES Act funding and that uh, is all on a website that would probably be uh, the probably on his website the DFM or the or governor's or website yeah <clears throat> so I can I'll find that while we're talking here and, and give you that at the end but I can yeah well maybe on transparent Idaho also. yeah that might be too the transparent Idaho website yeah, and, and so the Transparent Idaho is that website that Representative Dixon was talking about where right now you can look up and see all expenditures. Basically, it's a checkbook level detail. You can see what every agency is spending money on. And so Transparent Idaho will ha show all those expenditures. So there was $1.25 in the first round. Um, we'll have more money coming up here soon. But. It's been I'll take that as a look up, which is my Navy parlance for, yeah, I'll get an answer for you. And then my second question is, what is the bill for the parental rights? I should know that off the top of my head. <laughs> I, I'm thinking 146. Let me, uh, I can look that up too. Um, I'm trying to think about the discussions I heard listening to that vaccine committee on how those dollars were being doled out for those stations. So I, I'm not... It was pretty, n nothing too specific, but I'm sure if you're on Transparent Idaho, that's Health Sharing Ministries. Let me send out a lifeline real quick, and I'll, I'll, if my wife gets back to me quick enough, I'll tell you. <laughs> I'm sorry, I should know that off the top of my head. Sage, you touched on something that was actually my question for today, and that is these committee chairmen who sit on bills. Um, what can we do? Your final solution, well that sounds bad, the last suggestion you made <laughs> uh, is, is, is really the way to do it. So I've been a chairman, this is my second term as, as chairman of the business committee. I've never been pressured to hold a bill or to hear a bill from the speaker or especially from the governor's office. When we have our chairman's meetings, the speaker says, I put you guys in this position to make these decisions, I'm not influencing you. Now he may have an interest in something the same way every other legislator does, but I've never heard that and in speaking to my fellow chairman, they never have either. So it's not even something that happens privately in doing that. That's a common thought, but I have not experienced that since I've been a chairman or heard that. It is generally that chairman shaping what he wants to shape, shaping legislation. Sometimes the frustrating thing is not every idea is a good idea, even though people feel very strongly about it. Those bills sometimes aren't going to go anywhere in their present form. So usually a chairman will say, why don't you go work on this? Go talk to the Senate, because is there somebody in the Senate interested in hearing this? And when there are larger bills that are controversial, to, to make sure that it's going to go somewhere is sometimes a, a good idea. But I don't hold bills. And I've been... I'm not I've, accusing you. I no, I know that. I'm just saying that I share that philosophy. But I do kind of have a luxury that I don't have very many controversial bills coming through the business committee. So it's easy for me to say that. 
I've had lobbyists come and angry that we printed a bill and they know it's coming back, and I tell them, go do your work. You're paid to go talk to the committee members and convince them to go in your direction. I'm not going to hold the bill. The most I'll do is give them an extra week or something just to do that work, knowing we're busy. But um, five of the new chairmen that I were, came in with last term all hold to that same principle in doing that. And the new chairman of state affairs lets just about everything be heard, at least get a print hearing so it's got a bill number and getting into the process and doing that. So electing people that share that philosophy, and it's hard when they're not in our district, letting them know, I mean, if, con if you can contact people in their district to pressure them in that sense, that's really the only way that's going to stop. That, that philosophy that we share is not shared through a lot of people. They think that that's how uh, works that way in every other state, meaning that we're not the only state that has that issue, and, and they keep pointing to that, and they think that that is the chairman's authority to do those things. He is re-elected to the speakership because it's a race. And how does, it, how does this happen? I don't understand that one either because he's been surrounded by controversy. He's, he's another... Um... Voting machines? <laughs> right. We've got the Dominion voting machines for us. No. Um, I, I don't understand. So I, he does the work he needs to do to convince people to vote for him. I'll say that. I've not felt that pressure in any way, but I know that some people do. As far as he... he Campaigns, it's something you have to campaign for. And I ran for leadership two years ago. I don't like campaigning, especially for that. My thought is if you think I'm a good leader or gonna be good in that position, then vote for me, and if you don't, so be it. But people will start campaigning next year, at the end of next session, when we have an election coming up, if they wanna run for leadership and they're pretty sure they're going to get reelected, they'll start going around the state and meeting with the different representatives in the majority caucus and saying, here's my plan, here's what I'm gonna do. Promises are made about chairmanship sometimes or, or bills that you have and things like that. And that, it's an ugly part of the process, but it is part of the process of campaigning in that sense. And so I, as a representative Bedke, probably does a good job at that. I don't know. Yeah. It's just, it's, um, I'm the chairman of the ethics committee, so I get to count the votes and watch the process as well. And there's no funny business in there. We're all in a big room like this. Everybody gets a slip of paper, they write down the name they want, they come put it in the box, then I take the box with another representative and we count them and we allow witnesses for both candidates to come and they can watch and everybody watches it and gets the tally so there's no question about how it's counted or anything like that. Yes, I should have been surprised, but I was shocked that he was re-elected to that position again because he's, he's not working for us. He's not. His, his record is it doesn't look well. What, can I just real quick, I want to say something. I've had so many people ask the same question, and one thing I, I have to remind them, just like he pointed out, he's one of 70 as far as legislators go, so until you vote him out, until his people vote him out, this is going to be an issue, because as long as he gets voted in to office from his district, he will still be you know, able to do what he does to become a speaker, but if somebody were to run against him and he would lose, it'd be a totally different game, but we can't do anything about it outside of his district. That's the first thing. No, but Sage has a vote. Right, and that's it. Right. not to be in that position. Right, but, but, but he can do as that. long as he's there, yeah, as long as he's there, it's always going to be an issue with that specific person. So, and that goes for anybody of them, so fun. Thank you, Robin. Uh, Sage and Jim, I have a formal petition here. I'd like to read it to you guys. Okay. And then have you respond to that. Sure. Thank you. Dear Senator Woodward and Representative Dixon, we, the citizens of Boundary County, want to express our united intolerance for continued or additional emergency measures related to the 2019 coronavirus. Anyone capable of performing web searches and critical thinking can uncover overwhelming and wholly credible evidence that the 2019 pandemic is a global scheme to force an economic and social reset upon a largely unsuspecting world. From November 29 to present, mainstream media and social media have been propaganda mouthpieces and censorship vehicles. Working for the corrupt World Health Organization, the Center for Disease Control and Pharmaceutical Giants. Their nonstop narrative is intended to confuse the public, raise fear, lower morale, eliminate middle class earnings, and hard sell gene editing vaccine technology that already has killed or injured thousands. 
Governor Little's unjust and unconstitutional coronavirus restrictions have decimated Idaho businesses, while unethical financial incentives have rewarded the health institutions willing to claim coronavirus diagnosis in the presence of other prevailing health conditions. Restrictions have stripped workers of the ability to earn income and reduced formerly independent families to dependence upon successive rounds of stimulus payments paid against a runaway national debt with no foreseeable resolution. We in Boundary County never had a pandemic and we will not support restrictions to our constitutional inalienable and God-given rights currently being overridden. You are in office because people felt that they could rely upon you to represent their values. We are monitoring the legislative process closely, respectfully submitted by the following people. On February 10th, our local JBS chapter group, we emailed both of you. Um, Sage, I'm directing this question to you. We emailed you on February 10th, no response. Sent a follow-up email on February 26th, no response. So I'd like your response today. Okay. We have several of our members here. We'd like to hear what you have to say. Fine, and I agree with what you wrote. Maybe not to the full extent <laughs> of, 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 anyway, the premise of what you're writing, yes, I agree with. I never saw that first one, Steve. When you sent me the second one, I haven't had time. I intend to write you back. I know you asked me to, and I will. It's very busy. I've been very busy. It's both the chairman and then running legislation that I think addresses a lot of your concerns. Not every single one. The bring your freedom won't matter, but uh, the parental rights one addresses those concerns. I have a bill regarding federalism that will address a lot of those concerns as well coming up next week. So it's been a busy year. There's a lot going on, and it's hard to set time aside sometimes to respond. So I fully intend to respond to that last one on the 26th when we did communicate back and forth, but I didn't answer that yet. So there's nothing I'm running from. I don't even recall seeing it on the 10th, forgive me. There's hundreds of emails every day that come in at this point in time. So I'll give you an answer still if you want as far as that. Can, I can go line by line on that if you like, but I, that's nothing that I don't agree with, what you just read. So anyway, um, you guys drove right by us when we were off. I waved at you. We I waved at Linda. I saw Mary out there. So, I saw you out we there. We had uh, 93 signatures today alone. So good. Just from today. That's how Thank important you. it is to us. I understand, and please forgive me with the limitations on my time. And I don't. I, I labor over my writing to make sure it reads well and that I'm saying what I want to say, so it's not something I can just sit down and type out in doing that. So it was... That original petition was signed by 62, and this is by 93. So okay. I, I, I wanted health, so if you want to reach out to me, we're a large JBS uh, group here, and we want to be able to help facilitate you. So, but ignoring us doesn't work. So I want to make sure forgive me if it seems like your opportunity to redress our grievances. Certainly, and forgive me if you think I'm ignoring you, because I'm not. And I think you and I have communicated multiple times about these meetings and other things going back and forth. But this, I admit, no, I've not yet. But that's, I still will, if you'd like. Um, I'll tell you what would help. Right. You guys are Agreed. So one of the bills that's going through, that just went out of the Senate, headed to the House, and I'm sure it'll be fine in the House, uh, is that this is around the panel, panel uh, the, the health district board members, and, and the commissioners and, and that relationship there. Uh, originally, I thought that the, the commissioners uh, were supposed to be the health district board members, but I've read that code again, and I understand a little bit better now. That the, health, the, the commissioners, a county commissioner can either go and be on that board or can send someone there, appoint someone to represent them. Some of the commissioners go and some don't across the state. Uh, and so you end up with a, the health district board that may or not may not be an elected official, but it's still appointed by, that person is still appointed by an elected official. But the bill that just left the Senate the other day uh, says that if a quarantine order or isolation order is put in place by the health district, uh, then the commissioners in that, if it's a county-wide or district-wide, the the Panhandle Health District is the northern five counties, so if a, a, like right now we have a district-wide, that the county commissioners would have to concur with that agreement, otherwise it, or with that order or it would not go into place. So that's one piece that's, uh, that's, that'll probably come right out of this legislative session. Yeah. Mo most believe. legislators believe there's an inequity there with having these people make decisions that affect the population and they're not voted on. 
So we've been trying to move in that direction to make sure there's somebody that you have some action against, or we all do, essentially, as voters, that is making decisions regarding your life that you have action against in that point. So this helps minimally, but there's been stronger attempts to do it, and it goes back to at least the chairman of health and welfare in the House. And he's a strong personality and is very adamant. He's come after some things that he thinks he should have that have come through my committee to do with telehealth and different types of occupational licensing, not my committee, the House Business Committee. I'll get you, Sherry. Um, and that's where a lot of that has been stopped in doing that. And then, so we can advocate for those things, and we do, and we talk to leadership about it to try and impress upon him to hear these bills, but it's, it's gone nowhere thus far. So there are actions that are trying to be, happen. It's just our process, unfortunately, it they, they doesn't always get through. And I'm not saying that's good, but that's where we are as far as that goes with I, some of those things. I think the other one that came out, I'd have to double check the status, but it came out of the Senate also, uh, <clears throat> schools or universities that only the school district could close the school. And so the school district has an obligation to work with the health district and take that recommendation, but the school district makes a decision. Again, elected officials. And then uh, same thing at the university level for the closing those down. So. And um, I, I'm, Sherry's got a question. Oh. Sorry, Jim. Talking about ending the university over yeah. Isn't that something the legislature said they would get done before Ending what? Ending the emergency. Anything yes, and I'm trying to think where that is. Did you? Well, you've only got a couple of weeks left in session, is that correct? Yeah. It's still sitting in the House of Affairs Committee. Is it? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Um, somebody said it's still in House State Affairs. In the, in the uh, Chairman's floor? I don't know. I'm trying to think of what number that was, because one of the first things to pop out was that one to call us back. <laughs> and I'm trying to remember what that one was. And a lot of that discussion, and I think we talked about this a little bit last time, is, is making sure that we were going into the right section of code, and that's what was taking that time, because, well, there was the fear of, of, of the FEMA dollars. They, they come in with the emergency order also, so there wasn't, um, both so bodies weren't agreed about that. Surplus, you really need the FEMA dollars? Agreed, and that's why we did that in the summer, why the House, when we met in the summer, did the declaration, the concurrent resolution to end the emergency order then because the dollars that would have been lost were sitting there already with our, uh, what do you call it, beyond what we thought, the dollars or excess revenue. Revenue, revenue and excess revenue of anticipated. Revenue excess of anticipated. Um, yes, Sherry, and that's the point many of us in the House had when we did pass that out of the House. Um, there's not agreement on the other side of the rotunda or in the governor's office or in the AG's office, and that gums everything up. So I've not heard any talk about that. I don't know why that, that's done. Maybe somebody else is working and trying to get it through, but I've not heard of anything further at this point. House Bill 135 will probably address that, if, but I imagine the governor may uh, veto that, so we have to have the veto-proof majority, but that would limit it to 60 days without the legislature approving it. So if he gets done with the 30 days after that, let's say he signs it, the bill gets done, I mean, his emergency order is done, and then he wants to extend it, he would be able to for 60 days at that point, or 30 and 30, but then he would have to have the approval from the legislature coming in. And that's what House Bill 135 would say. So that may be why nobody else, or at least I've not heard of any further discussion with that, because that is, is what we're able to get through both bodies, I'm pretty sure, at this point, with a veto-proof majority. Um, but I don't think there's anything explicitly ending the emergency order. Whether you can end it or not without a veto, you should. It puts the burden on the, or focuses on the governor. He vetoes it. It shows us who's doing it. But the, last year there was two bills. I believe it was last year there was two bills passed. One was on uh, vital statistics on the birth certificate represented uh, the actual sex of a yes. child born, and the other one was to protect women's sports. And it was my understanding both those. Were been challenged in the courts. Um, the, I don't believe that the Attorney General is doing his job. Uh, it seems to me that the, the, the legislature should have its own representation, and I'm wondering if you can do that and hire your own attorneys, because I believe he's done a very, very poor job. 
And number two is, if those things are, are in litigation, why not pass more laws uh, in the same area if they need to be tweaked to, to, to do it again? And uh, it's, a, it's a major deal. Our, our nation was, you know, one of the issues is they threw the tea in the ocean for 3%. And now we've got people that are guys that are saying they're girls. And we can give them an original birth certificate issued without alteration. And it's like, does any, is anybody awake? Because this is far more than tax and spend. This is the very foundation of truth and reality. If you reject that, there's no stop. So would you address that? I, I can go or what? Yeah, I'm just thinking of what I saw. There is some, another bill. I, I'm not uh, up on the status of the court cases, so I can't really respond to that. But I, I just voted in support of the bill you spoke of last year. So the birth certificate bill got an injunction from a judge because she said she had ruled against it the previous year, or another a similar attempt or ruled against something, or a previous ruling that was contrary to. Um, I spoke with both of those ladies that, that ran those bills as they were going, and what we, we were very um, confident that our Attorney General would not be defending the position of the legislature on those bills, so we had a lot of discussions with national groups, the Alliance Defending Freedom, the Institute for Justice going forward, who helped craft those bills knowing that they would be challenged. And there's legal teams in both those issues that are working nationally on, the, on that as it goes through the system with the full intent of taking it all the way to the Supreme Court. So that's all in process on both those bills. Representative Ehart is traveling around the country to support other efforts in other states on fairness in women's sports. And that's a huge topic still going forward, especially with what this administration is doing. So we do get outside counsel. It's not explicitly our counsel, but we do have dollars as a legislature and as the House to go do that. And frequently we will do that on larger topics because the governor has his own counsel that often says, well, this isn't going to work. Or he advises the governor about some bills that we do. So to counter that, we do have counsel we use. It's not explicitly counsel for the House. There's been efforts to do that. And what we did do this year was, it probably hasn't gone to the Senate yet, but the House just passed it, to allow agencies to hire outside counsel so they're not wholly dependent upon the Attorney General as well in that sense. So we're, we're looking at other things. It's just, it, you know, as the process goes, not everybody agrees with that. And so it doesn't always move forward, but we continue to make those efforts. And I'm comfortable with, with or at least I'm, I am, I'm comfortable. I don't know if that's anything special, but... With those outside legal teams, with the Alliance Defending Freedom and the counsel that they provided in crafting those bills, knowing the challenges every step of the way, and that they're behind that effort, we're not solely relying on our attorney general. I don't even think he's a part of that, to be honest, or his staff, uh, as it moves through to, to the appeals courts and then on up in doing that. So we'll see. I'm, not, I'm more familiar with the fairness in women's sports and where that's at than I am the birth certificate one. All I've heard is, is that one was given an injunction, and I don't know if they've had hearings to appeal that to move forward, but they're not dead. And, and part of the birth, I mean, the Fairness in Women's Sports one, that was the shortcoming of it was it just said boys who claimed to be women. It had to do with Title IX. It didn't go in the contrary, so that was part of the argument against it. So if they had made it broader and just said anybody claiming to be a different gender and participating in sports of that one, the case would have been stronger. So there was some talk about ignoring that and running another bill that had that language in there so the case would be stronger, but I've not seen anything. I can ask Rep. Ehart if, if that's, I don't think that's a plan. She's not talked about that as she's gone around to these other states, but uh, that if was a- Yeah, if there is a flaw, that would be a reasonable thing to do. Right, right, and that's what, what I had discussed with, with the former congressman who's a lawyer about that, what he saw <laughs> with that, and, and thinking we may do that, but that's, I haven't heard that talk yet. They may wait till it gets further along to see if that's truly a deficiency, but that was what was cited originally as the reason that they thought it should be thrown out in doing that. So, okay. I'm gonna put a shameless plug real quick. There's a gentleman from Kootenai County running for AG. He act I actually heard him specifically complain about the fact that the legislature used to have their own attorneys, and I don't know if it was a creek one or the one before, but an AG pulled him out of the legislature and put him back in his office. He believes the legislature should have their own attorneys. So, Art McElmer is his name. He's running for attorney general. Look into him, listen to him over the next year. That is one thing he does believe, that the legislature or Senate should have their own attorneys so that they don't have to keep calling the AG office all the time. Right. And so that is one thing he's pushing for in his campaign. Oh. Really quick, it's House Bill 246. 
Yeah, okay. <laughs> Good. And then, oh, okay. One more. Yeah, because we can't leave the church here I didn't see you, Donna. You were probably on the other side of the road. She was over on the left. <laughs> yes. Forty-three on the rise. Right. <laughs> well, I'll give you some examples, Donna. And, yeah, I appreciate it. So, we ran a bill through the Senate, uh, a resolution for a constitutional amendment to outlaw psychoactive drugs, or to put in our constitution that we're not interested in marijuana or heroin or anything else. We see that in the other states. So that bill is run through the Senate. Uh, hasn't run through the house. It's going to be changed up a little bit and come back in a different form. The the Freedom Foundation scored that as a negative six. Democrats voted for it because they might be in support of legalizing marijuana for recreational or uh, med medicinal purposes. I voted against it because I don't believe in, that we need to have those drugs brought into our state. But that's just one example of that scoring mechanism. Uh, the Freedom Foundation scores uh, sometimes that are, I think, a little bit flawed. And I, while I observe that, uh, there's an app for that. So there's the Freedom Foundation app. You can look on your phone. You can see how bills are scored. Um, I, I have moved away from observing their scoring of bills because I, I think that they don't often reflect some of our Idaho values. Uh, marijuana. Yeah, there. I. Is that not a law? Right. I mean, what makes you think that if it's a law that it's not being obeyed, that the Constitution is going to make any difference? And furthermore, the Constitution is for granting rights. So right now, the the um, when we talk about uh, voter initiatives right now, there are two groups out collecting signatures. So in the 2022 ballot, you're going to see a couple different options. For sure, you'll most likely you'll see a, 
uh, you'll need to vote, do you want to legalize recreational marijuana? You'll probably also see on the ballot, do you want to legalize medicinal marijuana? And then if, if in response to the legislature, if we're able to pass this resolution, then you, the, the third option would be, would you like to enshrine in our constitution that Idaho is not interested in psychoactive drugs being legal ever? So those will be your options on the 2022 ballot. She's in charge of questions. Okay. I, I, have I, have Thank you. I have a very fast and yes or no. Oh, wait. She's the other girl. Thank you for being here. Um, something you said just a few minutes ago, Sage, was that you speak you speak you? You can, he can repeat the question. <laughs> <laughs> something that you were saying just a few minutes ago that you, um, as you're making these decisions, that you're often torn between trying to balance what the Constitution is asking of you and what um, industry and a lot of these big companies are influence, influencing you. And you said you had to kind of balance it out and figure it out. And to me, that kind of struck me. And I know we live in unprecedented times, and I know that everything is far more complex than probably any of us here can realize. And yet, I was a little stunned to hear that. And yet it's probably reality. And yet how much do you stand for America, for freedom, for keeping America, America, and not allowing outside influences, whether it's a, you know, some big tech company that belongs to China but ruling our country, how much do you recognize that? And how much do you stand up for our country and our freedom and our values and our constitution? That's imperative to me. I'm sorry if you misunderstood what I was saying. I wasn't saying I have to balance the Constitution with anything, but when I'm looking at not having Home Depot force you to have a vaccination to go in there to, so you can do commerce as you want to do, but also balancing that it's not government's job to tell private business how to behave. That's what I'm trying to balance is, okay. is which is superior there because those are, those are competing right now because of this whole COVID situation. Can I tell a business, no, you can't require masks, but it's private business. I don't like government intruding into private business. That's what I'm trying to balance. Okay. It's not your constitutional rights, and I'm being influenced by somebody from China in okay. that sense at all. No, our, our freedoms are imperative to me. I have a bill that will be supporting federalism and allowing us to push back against the federal government. It should be heard next week. It's a method. It's probably not as fast as some people want, but it's a procedure that I think will give us legal grounds to say no to the federal government if it makes it through and it goes through a process in doing that. I'm not somebody that goes out and shouts, hey, look at me. I just get my work done quietly and influence people by the relationships that I have with them. It's very easy to go out and just say, this is wrong and look at me and give me attention, but then nothing gets done a lot of times. So I'm quiet about the work I do. I'm happy to share it when people ask me, but you're not gonna hear me broadcasting things usually. I'm down there and I have been for this past seven years working to protect our freedoms in that way and trying to find avenues where I can influence everybody in that body. And I, I, I think I've done a fairly good job of it. I think I have good respect throughout the whole building there and including the governor's office where they may not agree, but I have the opportunity to go express what I think is right or tell them no and tell them why about certain things. And that's an effective way, I, th I find it effective for me and with my personality and the way I handle things. But it's always upholding those core values that we were founded on and not allowing things to get out of control with government or, or business in per doing those things and doing that. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to explain that if other people heard that. It wasn't a forsaking the Constitution. It was two things that are very constitutional as far as government's influence in private business, but also our private rights as citizens. And that, that is a difficult decision to make where I want to say no to private business, but then that sets a precedent. That then somebody after me could say, well, we did this, so why can't we tell them to have a $15 minimum wage? Why can't we tell them who they can hire and not hire? And things like that that we always have to be careful of. We won't always be here, and so the things we do need to have lasting value and not create a problem further down the line. Thank you. And I understand that people, uh, yeah, that you, you know, working quietly and whatnot and how that is effective, and I admire that and appreciate that. On the other hand, people throughout the state they're hungry to hear that, yes, someone is out there working for us. And if so, if you could quietly get that, it would be okay. great. There's many of us doing that work. It's just, it's difficult. 
and our process demands deliberation and, and that we get everybody on board with things. And so I'm, I'm, things are moving in a direction I'm happy with, but it's not exactly like I want because the senator and I have to agree and then there's 103 other people, or at least the majority in each body and, and all that to make this process work. And that's a safeguard for us in the long run because if things were to go through too quickly, then lots of bad things could happen when the wrong people are there in doing that. But um, I'll try and be a little more noisy maybe. It's just hard for me. I guess Thank those you. all the bills that are heard each day, all on his website, on the Facebook page yeah. and the Mibi page. So if you're interested in what's been heard or what's in front of the, the house that day, you can go on those pages. And there's usually like 20 of them a day. I mean, I just kind of scroll through for a while. So but he puts them out every day. Every, this is what they're seeing every day. This is what they're discussing. This is what's in front of them every single day. So you can go look. And it's good there, Slam. And you can also follow that status, of course, at legislature.idaho.gov. And everything is kept, kept up to date within just a few hours time. So when a committee decides on something or something's voted on the floor, if you're at legislature.idaho.gov, uh, first uh, legislative sessions, is the one, there are a bunch of boxes there that you can look up the Constitution, you can look up the code, but right up in the upper left-hand corner it says legislative sessions, and it'll, it'll pop up by default to the 2021, the current session, then you can go and look at bills. You can also go back in time and look at all the results from other sessions and, and do homework there. But There's a bill tracker. You can track specific yeah. the, bills by their number. Yeah, bill. And yeah. for their time. Yeah. There's lots of things that you can do. It's a lot easier to be in, in uh, up to date 450 miles away from Boise than it used to be. Yeah. <laughs> you can even we, testify. We really need to end because the church. You know, there's a limited time frame that the church is allowed us to be here. It's been an hour and a half already. So one thing is about communication. Oh, okay. Okay. Last one, very, very last one. You can chat with him afterwards. Yeah, we'll be That's here leaving. for a little bit. Well, I'd like everybody here. Okay. Is it okay? Yeah. One, give me one. <laughs> <laughs> you do mention that you get a lot of emails and you can't always respond to everything. Uh, Steve, I don't know if it was Sage, and at one time you were reading in, in a meeting a response you got, and everybody started reciting it in the thing. It was kind of a form response. That was, uh, that was great. Oh, okay, sorry, yeah. somebody else. But I wonder if. We, if there isn't a flag we could put on an email from just something local here, it might get your attention, yeah. you know, that says, hey, this is from Bonner's Ferry, blah, blah, blah. And to just get your attention, even on the short term, because we, we have a whole lot more questions that we'd like to ask, and, and, and then we can get a uh, response. Kind of flag it sure. so everybody can. So uh, that, I skim my email typically by, uh, you know, if I see a name, because a lot of times it's an organization, but if you see a name, I'll quickly go to the bottom. If somebody puts Naples, Moye, Bonner's Ferry, then uh, I'm going to try and respond to that within a day. How about Steve Kirk, the Bonner's president of John Burt Society? So, I'm representing 90 people. So if, 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 you, if you're right, I think if you put in the subject line, Bonner's Ferry, uh -huh. that makes it, it'll be right on the top, and I'll yeah, see it. Yeah. That'll help. Yeah, if you little, put in the subject line uh, District River. 1 or Bonner's Ferry or Best Place in the World, something like that. <laughs> the gym. Yeah. Which of the things you want to address? Yes. Yeah, Jewel of the Jimson. Thank you. Thank you so okay, much. thank you very much.